Hello and welcome to Cellular and Genetic Biology, Biology 230. Today we're going to be going over carbon and carbon compounds. This is chapter 4 of your book. Uh, please make sure you review this before lecture. So as far as carbon is concerned, it's actually one of the key elements found in the biological systems. Here we actually have four of those key elements also uh, found in the biological systems. First we have hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and last carbon, but also uh, refer to phosphorus and sulfur, which are very commonly found in proteins and genetic materials such as DNA and RNA. One of the reasons why I put this up here is because I want you to notice that uh, um, carbon right here actually has four uh, valence uh, or four vacancies in the valence shell. So that gives it the ability to bond up to an additional four atoms. Now these atoms don't necessarily have to be other carbon atoms. Uh, they can actually be any particular atom that also has some vacancies and is willing to share electrons. So here you have some examples of substances actually made from carbon, uh, like methane, ethane. All these structures actually are very energy rich. If you actually notice, we use them as fuel sources. Uh, so carbon is very stable, but willing to release a lot of energy when you actually break off part or uh, segments of the actual structures that are made from it. You will actually notice throughout your book that a lot of uh, formulas or substances or compounds will have several illustrations or ways in which you describe it. So you'll have the molecular formula, the structural formula. A lot of times you'll see the ball and stick model to actually see the arrangement or ge geometric arrangement of the actual compound itself and the space filling seen, um, the space that the electrons are actually taking up in the actual compound. So as far as carbon, it's usually <clears throat> the backbone of a lot of compounds simply because it's so very readily available in the environment. Uh, so some structures may be especially short or long, uh, but if you see right here, carbons attached to each other in a chain. Sometimes the chain will actually have double bonds. So when that actually occurs, uh, carbon actually will not bond to one additional atom because it most likely is double bonded to a carbon. In some cases you might actually find a double bond to an oxygen or some other type of atom. So you could actually have branches coming off that carbon backbone and you could actually form uh, rings as well. So carbon is very versatile. Car like I said before, carbon doesn't necessarily have to be bonded to additional carbons. Uh, here you have uh, two examples of waste products that are produced as biological uh, metabolism runoffs. So here you have carbon dioxide, which is a common uh, waste product that's produced from a lot of chemical reactions in the biological system. Uh, here you actually have uh, urea, which is also produced from protein metabolism. In both cases, you actually have carbon that is actually bonded to oxygen. Uh, here you have double bond to oxygen. Hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are basically carbons bonded to hydrogens only. So you have long chains of carbons bonded to hydrogens. These are especially important because these make up a lot of energy molecules, especially in the biological system, that are actually utilized to store energy. So right here I have an example of storing energy. Here we have two canisters. This is a spray glue, so you don't think of necessarily spray glue as having a lot of energy, but if you actually expose this canister to heat, what will happen? The actual canister will explode because of the energy actually being stored in the actual container itself. Um, you will notice that you'll see Homer Simpson a lot in these slides, and usually when you see that, that's an area of importance, so make sure you look this up and try to find out as much in information as possible about this particular work. So in this case, we actually have fat. So fat is actually a high energy molecule, which is especially used in biological systems. So this is actually what fat looks like. It's actually referred to as adipose. Adipose is especially found in the peritoneum and it can be actually found in a lot of organs, especially like the liver. Uh, you can find it around the heart, a lot of organs that actually will have a lot of fat around them. And that's for quick release of energy to those cells so that way they don't necessarily have, have to wait for you to metabolize energy from whatever foodstuffs you're eating to actually get that energy uh, into the bloodstream and then to the cells. These fat deposits are very close to certain organs so that way they can very quickly get the energy when they need it. 
So another name for uh, fat cells are adipose cells. Uh, here you actually have what the structure looks like. So you have several chains of carbons actually attached uh, to hydrogens. So isomers, these are compounds, once again, a lot of them are mainly composed of carbon, um, that actually look very similar. Even though they look similar, they don't necessarily have the exact same function. Uh, so sometimes may be referred to as structural isomers, uh, geometric isomers, and enantiomers. So here you have the structural, and then here you have um, functional, and here you have the enantiomers. So um, as far as the structural main thing is, they have the same exact formula, um, but in this particular case, you actually have a branch coming off. Uh, here, you actually have an example of the cis and the transform. So you may actually have, uh, let's say if these two X's right here are actual functional groups, um, in this particular case, the two functional groups are on the same side of the, the carbon chain, but in this particular case, they're on the opposite side. So that may actually give it a different function. Here uh, you have the enantiomers. These actually have the same exact uh, placement of the functional groups or the atoms or structures attached to the carbon, uh, but it's a mirror image. So that particular arrangement may give it a different function. So here you actually have uh, two examples of um, two substances or compounds that actually have the same atoms in them. Um, they just have the system to transform of them. So here you have ibuprofen and here you have albuterol. So ibuprofen is mainly used as a form of pain relief. It basically is associated with the hormones that uh, reduce, well, it actually reduces the hormone production that actually results in the pain or inflammation. So that way the pain will actually go down. Uh, albuterol is mainly used as a muscle relaxant or a um, bronchiodilator, which basically makes the muscles that are associated with breathing in the airway actually relax so that it makes it easier for you to get airflow to those areas. So basically here you have an example of isomers, two different functions and they actually have um, different target arrangements for cells. Another thing is uh, to actually make a compound functional, you need what's referred to as a functional group. Functional groups are additional atoms or groups of atoms attached to a compound that have the ability to release part of it or uh, actually absorb additional hydrogen ions in the environment or allow for bonding that basically give a substance its special powers or uh, ability to cause a reaction to actually happen. So here you have two examples, estradiol and testosterone. Estradiol is also referred to as um, estrogen. So these two substances um, have different target areas. Uh, testosterone is mainly used for um, male libido. It actually increases muscling and uh, increases hair growth, uh, things that are associated with uh, the male gender. Um, estrogen associated with the female gender. Um, it's especially important for certain hormone functions that allow for de fat deposition. Um, it's associated with a lot of functions of the heart, uh, liver, so on and so forth. Uh, the main difference is you actually may see a different placement of functional groups. So right here on uh, the testosterone, you have an additional um, methyl group right here. Um, and on the estrogen, you have a hydroxyl group right here. And uh, right here, it would actually be uh, um, a carbonyl group. So that's the main difference right there. So there are several functional groups. You have the hydroxyl group, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfhydryl, phosphate group, uh, methyl group. So the main thing is I want you to go back through your book and look up all these groups and look at the arrangement. What does the actual structure look like? For example, the methane group, um, that's basically a methyl, methane actually attached to a substance or a compound, um, but it's just missing one hydrogen that allows for it to actually attach to that particular substance. Um, once again, high energy. Uh, phosphate groups, you actually see this in a lot of energy transfer molecules, such as ADP and uh, the nucleotides before they're actually utilized to actually form your um, RNAs and your DNAs. And a hydroxyl group, that's just an OH group added. And a lot of times, you actually release that to allow for bonding and building up of monomers into uh, 
poly polymers, so to make larger substances. Uh, so you have the carbonyl group. Um, that's basically just uh, carbon uh, double bonded to an oxygen. And a lot of times you'll see this in preservatives such as uh, aldehydes and formalin. And here you have the carboxyl group. That's basically a carbon with two oxygens and a hydrogen. And a lot of times you'll see this in organic acids that have the ability to actually release hydrogen ions, basically a hydrogen with a positive charge. This is commonly seen in amino acids, nucleic acids, and fatty acids. Um, and here you have the amino group. Um, and this is more of a base, so it's willing to actually receive those hydrogen ions. And it's very commonly seen in amino acids. So, um, ATP is basically the universal cellular energy form. And one of the reasons why it has the ability to give cellular energy is because it actually has a lot of energy stored up in the functional groups on it. This particular substance actually has what's referred to as three uh, phosphate groups. So if we actually look at it, here we have the three phosphate groups. And when this particular substance is utilized to actually release energy, uh, basically it reacts in water, and especially in the biological system, you see a lot of water present because cells are mostly water. Uh, so it's readily available. So when you actually have this particular substance uh, react with water, it will actually cause the release of one of the phosphate groups. Um, and that breaking off of a phosphate group releases energy for cellular activity. Um, when that actually happens, the ATP is referred to as ADP or diphosphate. In this particular case, it's triphosphate uh, because it has actually lost one phosphate group. Now, this particular substance could actually be recycled. Whenever uh, cells take in an energy form, it could actually uh, utilize some of that energy to actually allow for any free-floating phosphate groups to actually bind to any ADPs, actually creating ATP. So restoring the energy storage form of this molecule called ATP. So in summary, main thing is uh, carbon is readily available uh, throughout the environment. So a lot of substances are made from it. Uh, it is needed for life because it is important to have carbon to build a lot of biological substances uh, referred to as proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, and also lipids, which are the main uh, macromolecules found in the living system. Uh, it is referred to as an organic compound uh, because of the carbons present. And that's pretty much it for today.